Hi everyone, I'm Mara Webster with SAG AFTRA Foundation and thank you so much for tuning in to watch another one of our conversations at home videos today. Um, before we get started in today's conversation, I want to continue reminding everyone watching these videos that the SAG AFTRA Foundation as a nonprofit organization is continuing to raise money for our COVID-19 emergency assistance fund. This is working to help actors who are currently all out of work due to every single film and television production being closed down right now with paying basic bills, making rent, paying mortgage, buying groceries, whatever it is they need just to get by day by day right now. So please check out the details below this video and consider supporting if you're able to in any way. Um, today we're incredibly fortunate to be joined by the wonderful Kaylee Carter who's currently starring in Mrs. America which is my new favorite binge obsession <laughs> and I've enjoyed watching it it's so much and and I wanted to just kind of start by asking you a little bit about your quarantine experience. It, I, I hear that you've been doing a lot of baking and I was curious if you've had any particular victories or, or new skills that you've learned. A lot of cooking, a lot of baking. It's something I enjoy anyway, so it's a great excuse to be doing it more in this time or to tweak recipes that that we have and, and that we want to make better. There's like a chocolate chip recipe that we're, every time we make it, we shift a little something, and I think I'm nearing recipe, like the, the peak of perfection, so that makes me happy. And in terms of the show, I wanted to start by asking you about the audition process because you actually originally went in for a different character, the one that ended up being played by, by Ari Grainer. And, and I feel like acting as a career is, is such a space that you can never really predict where the opportunities are going to come from. And, and I was interested in, for you, the importance in just always keeping your mind open and keeping doors open, even when opportunities don't always come through the way that you hope and expect at first. Oh, yeah. I mean, that process was months long. I think... Um, I think sometimes we forget about that. There's been so many times that as an actor, I, I really try to make it like a mental health practice to forget about the audition immediately after I walk out of the room or immediately after I send it off the self tape. It just doesn't, um, it just doesn't do me any favors to think about it after that. I've done my part and then you hand it off to the incredible casting and, and the folks in charge. And, um, but this one I knew I wanted to be involved with in any capacity possible. Didn't really care what that was. I thought, okay, this is a project that's going to need a lot of women. Um, so I, I really tapped my agents and said, whatever it is, if I'm set dressing on this set, I've got to be. I've got to be a part of this this group of women. Um, and then it, it, it was weeks and weeks, and then the part of Pamela came through, and it felt. Um, it felt like such an incredible opportunity that I might not have thought of for myself um, to play her. Like it would have felt so at home to play a feminist and uh, this incredible leader of the movement. Um, and it would have been such a wealth of real information about a person who lived. But it was a very exciting prospect to get to play a person who um, who was so different from me. That was I, I wouldn't have given that opportunity to myself if I didn't stay open to it. Yeah, and, and when you're going into an audition such as for this show, what does that preparation process look like for you? Because obviously you don't have all the details of the character, you don't have all the fully fleshed out information about them, and you don't even have all, all the scripts to know their story and where this piece is in in terms of the larger picture. So how do you navigate kind of breaking that down and deciding what choice you're ultimately going to make in your performance in the room? The scene for Pamela was um, was the beauty shop scene. It's the very first scene that I'm in with Sarah Paulson and Kate Blanchett, and I um, I looked at at the bones of of this scene, and it was you know like it's it's a scene to introduce you to three people, so you're not delving deep into the emotional life of these characters, um, but immediately I sensed a a fear in these women. Um, in losing their place or not feeling seen and heard. And so that was something I grabbed onto immediately. And then the second thing was that, um, was kind of art imitating life, just putting myself in the situation of this woman who looks up to these other women who are um, her ideals of motherhood and, uh, and, and womanhood. Um, and, thinking about Kate and Sarah, it was a pretty easy comparison to feel like I'm a younger actor in the room with these two incredible actors who I love and admire and respect. And um, that just that energy kind of lent itself to putting me in the, the 
feeling and who she is in this moment. Yeah. And then when, once you had some of the scripts for the show, because they weren't all written up front, you didn't have them all to hand. What, what did that process look like for you? And I was also particularly curious in terms of the fact that, that you are a writer yourself as well and, and how that influences the way that you kind of take the lines and break them down and, and analyze your character so wholeheartedly. Everything I, I'm really a script as, as textbook and guide and, um, and Davi Waller is such an incredible writer and, she has such an ear for the way people speak and so much attention to detail that I knew every glance in that script, every word on the page, or even an unspoken moment with Sarah, I knew that we were laying the track the entire time um, to tell the story in, in not a lot of time. There are so many women in this show. There's so many stories to tell. And it, it was, the acting was like teeny tiny microseconds of connection with everybody to lay in foundational work that would then pay off eight episodes later um, without even ha having read episodes eight and nine. So it was really coming to Dobby and, and Micah and talking to them and Kate and, um, about about what was to come, what their ideas were for how Pamela's story resolves um, and the ways in which we were going to be able to show that and the ways in which we wish we could have shown it had we had three more hours. So all of those conversations were, were very formative. And um, I felt like I had so much at my disposal, even though I didn't have the scripts yet because I had the people who were... I had the people who are writing it and were very generous in their information to me. Mm -hmm. And then when, once you kind of stepped into the space with everyone and you were with Davi and you were, you know, going through table reads and, and getting to exist on set and, and see how the rest of the cast were all playing their characters, were, were there things that you kind of really uncovered about Pamela and understood about her within that space alongside the rest of the cast and creative team that you maybe hadn't uncovered in your own work by yourself beforehand? Oh yeah. I mean, I told, I told Sarah this the other day that I think, I think I found Pamela when I met Alice, like when I saw what Sarah was bringing into the room and I saw the ways in which they were going to be linked, uh, that really made the difference for, for how I chose to play her. And the other part of that was that Melanie Linsky was a new mom on set. And so watching her, be a mother for the first time and um, watching how incredibly hard she was working at that new job that was e extremely time consuming and our job, which was 18 hour days times, that was a huge bolstering of who Pamela was because I, I thought about all the options and all of the access that we as women have now and in this career a lot of the time um you know melanie has a supportive partner and pamela's husband is is not and all of those differences really helped shape um who she became yeah i loved so much when i heard that melanie linsky was was on set with with her baby and and that, that was part of the experience and and i wanted to ask you about that because i think i think that sets in general are not always a space that that have that sort of environment and can be family friendly for people to bring their kids in in that easily and you know i think we're seeing it right now with with the fact that child care and work have suddenly become one thing and and i was interested in in the way that kind of really spoke to the overall environment of of how this set was and and what some of the unique aspects of working on this show were from that yeah I the it's it's really the group of it's really the group of women and the women who were in charge making all of that possible um Tracy Ullman's dog was running around and her grandson came through and and Melanie's beautiful baby was around and we all couldn't get enough of her and it it did feel like such a collective energy of of what can we do how can we help Kate was working unbelievably long days and and still you know you know telling us I gotta wake up with the kids in the morning so watching all of them was a huge honor and an opportunity to to feel as though these are women who have maintained such like incredible careers and have done it while not compromising who they are as 
as mothers and I, I do hope to someday do that job and I want to be able to still do my job um, and be myself fully. So I, um, I loved watching them do that. It was a very supportive set and we all were not from Toronto and that's where we were shooting. So there were a lot of nights spent in a, the lobby bar together. We were loud and we did not blend in. <laughs> did that really lend itself to then when you were on set and you were filming together, just the fact that you were all on location and you were kind of in this ecosystem that was created just for, just for making the show and, and how did that really help you in terms of your performance? Well, I think all of us were a little jealous that we didn't get more to do with the feminists and we got very worried that maybe they were having more fun than us. Um, just because of the nature of what we were showing is these women who it's sort of like there's a public facing perception and then there's an, a, a home life or a domestic perception. And so all of those teas and luncheons and things that we were filming were a person putting on putting a presentation on top of themselves and the feminists were, you know, sitting cross-legged with, with cigarettes and music going. And we were like, they're definitely having more fun than we are. Um, all of our legs are crossed, so we must not be having a good time. Um, but we all, there was a lot more commingling of us off of set than there was on. And so I think that carried over, I think that carried over into everything. Um, it just had to. And then it was so much more fun after having had drinks with Margot to do, to do a scene with her. I felt I probably would have been in a totally different headspace coming to act with Margot Martindale if, if I hadn't already been um, cracking up with her. So. That's remarkable. And in, ter in terms of, you know, the two strands of storytelling that we see with, with the Phyllis Schlafly group and, and with the, the Gloria Steinem group, I was interested to kind of know how much you really paid attention to that storyline or how much it informed what you were doing and the way that you were thinking about your character and, and this group of women, because they're very much kind of, they're balancing out the two different perspectives from each other. Well, it was very important to know all of the, all of the historic information and the timeline of what was happening politically for them. I mean, that was extremely necessary because these women in Phyllis Schlafly's um, anti-ERA group, they were women who were not politically savvy. They were not motivated. Some of them did not vote until um, Phyllis, Phyllis got them voting. Um, and then all of a sudden for them to come together and form a grassroots movement that was able to pull, you know, 15,000 people of their cause to a, to a town where a convention was happening with support from the White House and money from the White House that had 20,000 people. I mean, that, it, it was a group of women in Phyllis's house. It was a small coalition of people that then turned out a mailing list of 40,000. And so those women had to be extremely um, up happening feminist side of the argument. Fortunately, the information that they were getting was all through Phyllis as a source because she was the only one who was politically involved before then. So um, it really speaks to the power, uh, what motivate people to get involved. Um, and, and they certainly were motivated by feeling a loss. And that's what they were operating from. I mean, it's so amazing the amount of information that the show is able to convey using these characters as a vehicle and even just the way that you're talking about it and having all these facts and, and statistics to hand as well at this point. And I know that you've mentioned previously how, you know, your education in Florida didn't really teach you anything about this movement. I know my education in England, we never heard about any of this. And, and, and just kind of given with that in mind, what was your process for, for researching and, and finding that information because there is so much information out there but you really have to kind of go through a lot to find what's going to be useful in terms of your character and their place in this story so how did you set about that monumental task i so i felt like i had a, an incredibly strong groundwork in that i've read i've read the feminine mystique and i've read all of gloria steinem's books and i i had like a very i had a very strong foundation in feminist literature 
through my mother, through, um, through the older women in my life who were, t- who were trying to bridge the gap between the education, the public education and what they thought might be valuable and important history for me to learn as a human. I mean, I had a book, I had a book by the time I was four, that was like the ABCs, but they were women who changed America. So that, that was all really strong, strongly laid foundation. If anything, uh, I, I definitely needed to know the timeline of events and the, the changing of hands politically, but I had to forget a lot of my feminine, like I had to forget a lot of that foundational feminist um, feminist education more than anything else. I had to sort of um, distance myself from it because I, because Pamela didn't have that information. <laughs> um, so that was, it was actually like an unlearning process that I found myself doing <laughs> then, then a learning, a learning curve that it was a, but it was a reverse learning curve. So that was, that was a lot. And then I, I, every time I read a script, there would be something that occurred that I would, you know, fact check, but you know, I'd, I'd go and do some research when I hit one of the conventions and was reading conversations and, and so much of the information there is really peeled right from it. And then everything Dobby does to take liberties for these characters is just to get to the human motivation of why it's happening. Um, But all of the, all of the conventions, all of that, I found myself going on many like late night rabbit holes down Google. So. Yeah. And, you know, because you were mentioning that, that concept of, of empathy and really understanding these characters from a, a human connection level and understanding their motivations and, and where they were coming from and what their wants and needs were. Um, I was interested in if that was something that you all talked about together on, on set amongst the cast and amongst the creative team, because, you know, I think so often when we see characters like Phyllis and, and like this whole group of women, including Pamela portrayed, we see them as very one dimensional and everything feels very black and white, but the show so successfully captures that, that gray area and nuance and really makes them such layered humans. And so I was interested if, if that was a really conscious choice that you were all thinking about throughout the process of making the show. Oh yeah. I think especially on, on our, on Phyllis's camp, we were very, we were we felt tasked with the responsibility to not judge these women and um because it just wouldn't have been it wouldn't have been possible and i i held on to little things like i remember the first time it said that uh, that pamela is doodling on something um and and that it became clear that she was an artistic creative person who'd never gotten the opportunity to be an artistic creative person because there's no outlet for that for a woman who, you know, was graduating high school in the, in the sixties. Um, there was none of that for her. And this is an opportunity for her to get to be creative. And I came to Davi and I said something about, I said, well, you know, she's a doodler and she just does it unconsciously. And I was reading that um, people who doodle tend to have, faster problem solving skills than, than other people because their brains are, are activated when they're doodling differently. And Davi was like, yeah, I've never heard of that. I, uh, I just wrote that thing. And I like was, I was just grabbing onto anything, any little thing I could that would make Pamela feel real to me. Um, and it ultimately became about her skills as an artist and as a woman were valued in that room by these other women in a way that her skills were not valued at home by her husband. And, um, you know, maybe not by her sister-in-law or her mother, that maybe there's a lot of criticism of Pamela that happens all the time. And these women, um, she's almost, she's almost more willing to take their critical feedback so that she can use it to help. She just wants to be useful. Um, and I think everyone can relate to wanting to be useful. Yeah. And one of the things that you do so well in in the performance and is so interesting to watch is, is like you were saying, a lot of her motivating factor within this group of women is her home life, is her family life and and not feeling fulfilled and and hurt in that space. And, And I was interested in the way that you thought about bringing that to the forefront of your character, because you're essentially playing that on screen and in every single moment that we see you, but we never actually see any of those moments, but it feels so grounded and, and so fleshed out through your performance. 
Well, thank you. I think that was also, I think that was helped a little bit by, um, I had just wrapped right before Mrs. America started a film that comes out this summer called Let Him Go. And it, it was a much more out and out um, physically abusive relationship that was being portrayed. And um, so a lot of the work that I did, and it's set in the 1960s. So I had moved from one decade and just moved a little bit further down the line in time, but they're very different women. But the information that I had, I had read, um, all of it that I had found, and I had talked to a family friend who had left an abusive relationship, and um, it was very important to me to understand the factors involved for staying, and um, especially the historic context that that took. And so all of that information that I had from Let Him Go that I built, I then got um, Pamela. And when I got that job, um, you know, the relationship with her husband was not something that we found out that I found out immediately. It was little information that I set it down and I went, okay, <laughs> this seems like it may be an emotionally abusive relationship. <laughs> um, and I felt, I felt like I understood, um, the separation of power that like she was supposed to be kept powerless. Um, in her situation and that she needed to feel like she needed that man, like she wouldn't be able to do anything on her own. And I think that there's a tiny glimmer when she goes to the Houston convention in episode eight of the possibility that maybe she is capable, but ultimately women of that time and of the social group that she would have been a part of would have been told that they're only good at, at two things, being a wife and mother. And she didn't even feel very good at that. So how sh could she be capable of leaving, of leaving a man and getting a job and starting over from scratch when she doesn't feel very capable as a wife and mother as it is? That's a, that all really helped to ground it, even though we barely see Kevin. So ultimately, it wasn't about him. Um, he's not some genius who kept her. She, there were factors going on within herself that she just couldn't overcome. Yeah, and I also, I, I love something that you've spoken about previously in terms of the way that you work and build a character very much from, from the inside out, you know, which you're, you're speaking to so eloquently right now. And, but that also particularly with a period piece that you really like to ask yourself a lot of questions about that set of circumstances and, and what choices would be available to them, what they would be told day to day, kind of how they would be raised differently and, and how that would all inform their viewpoint. And, and I was curious at which point you started kind of sitting there with that specific roadmap of I'm going to ask myself these types questions about myself and how that really became a key part of your process in developing characters. I'm always a person who sits down and immediately finds in, in the script as I get them everything that I say about myself, everything that other people say about her and all of the, the facts. Just every, every piece of information that I could actually that is black and white in the script. I'm not I'm not much of an inventor. I've never been able to, maybe because I just haven't felt that it was necessary. I've never been able to invent additional things for this person that aren't there. Um, it's more of an imagining of, okay, if this is what is said about her mother, then these other things are probably true about her upbringing. Um, so you have to start asking those questions pretty immediately. And a lot of that is socioeconomic. I could immediately tap into the fact that Pamela was also a little bit underneath the socioeconomic level of, of Phyllis and Alice. And there is this keeping up with the Joneses that she's trying to do for herself. There's a little bit of, well, if I try to look like them, like a lot of her outfits, being a, uh, our costume designer is so brilliant, but a, a lot of the conversations that we had are, how do we show Pamela in her various children? Like how do we taking care of herself and when she's not? And how do we show a sort of evolution of her trying to dress like these women, but not having the means to, or trying to show up looking just as ritzy as them and not being able to. So the costuming also felt like it was such a, an immediate flag into who she was. 
Yeah, and there's such a unique aspect in terms of this show as well because there's so many time jumps between episodes and we really see such a, such a rich passing of, of time. And, and for you in terms of, of your work in, in this character, how would you navigate that space and think about how much you wanted to create for yourself, even, even just in your own imagination about what, what her journey would have been between each of the moments where we, where we see her. Cause sometimes it's a full year has passed. She's had another child and, and so much has changed in her life since. It was very much keeping track of the children. We, we did have to sort of post it note and tally, like how many kids does Pamela have in the start of this episode? Um, is she pregnant again? It was like very important to me to track the pregnancies um, and keep keep that secret for myself in an episode. If I knew that in the next episode it was going to be a time jump and Pamela was going to have a kid, then that it meant that in this scene she was pe- pregnant and she knew that. It, did she know she was pregnant? Did she not? That information felt very important to me. Um, and what goes along with a woman being pregnant and in a fight that feels very emotional and visceral to her in a fight that she believes is for her daughter. Um, that was very important. I remember looking at episode nine and she has four children by the start of the last episode. (laughs) Um, and that's in a, that's in less than a decade. She has four children and, um, So it was very important to me because the spacing meant that during episode eight, Pamela would be pregnant again. And that became the like guiding principle of crafting that entire episode's performance was, um, it was, oh no, she's pregnant again. (laughs) Um, that, that was it. (laughs) And I also I wanted to ask you about, you know, working on this show where it's it's not just the cast, it really is kind of transcending to this amazing group of women behind the camera. You have Kate Blanchett as an executive producer and you have the most incredible directors like Janixa Bravo and Alma Sante and Anna Bowden working on it. And and since you you know you've spoken in the past about how, you know, you constantly have aspirations beyond acting in the industry and, and it interest in fields in directing and in producing kind of how this was a really unique opportunity for you to learn and how you really moved around the space and, and just paid attention to, to certain details to just take it all in day to day. I'm always taking it all in. I'm always asking questions. I've made that kind of a rule for myself that no matter what set I step on, um, it's very easy to feel like you're the lowest man on the totem pole in a cast like this. It's very easy to feel like Oh my God, look at the years of experience. Look at the ability in this room. Um, Maybe I do not belong here, but it has been a very important thing to me to ground myself in the acceptance that I would not be in that room if I was not supposed to be. And so every time I'm in one of those rooms, I'm asking as many questions as possible and not being embarrassed to be curious about it. Um, because making movies is not something you, anybody knows how to do at birth. And it's something that is a learned skill and people get better at it with time. And, you know, Kate has become an, a producer sort of recently in the timeline of her career. She was an actor for most of it. Um, and watching her be a producer was incredibly impactful. And I definitely stole a lot of information from her. Um, just watching her in the room, just watching her attention to detail and the fact that she wasn't only concerned with, I mean, she had to be obsessed to be playing Phyllis because you, there's an unbelievable amount of video and information and the accent and the walk and all of it that she was doing to craft this character was extremely important to her, but it was as important to her as watching the arc of the entire story and making sure that we were, we were really um, connecting each moment. So that, that gave me a lot of, um, a lot of excitement about being able to do that as well. And I'm, I'm looking forward to doing that. (laughs) I I need way more experience, way more film sets uh, my way. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, I feel like you've been on some pretty great ones so far. And, and thank you yeah. so much for taking time to talk to us about working on the show. It's, I feel like it's, it's a masterclass in acting, watching all of the performances, including yours. So thank you. 
Oh, thank you so much. That's very kind of you to say. And I've, I've really enjoyed chatting with you.